Today, let's talk about escape velocity. What is escape velocity? Well, as the name implies, you are reaching a specific velocity to escape something. I had a better intro sought out, then I procrastinated and completely forgot what it was. Anyways, as for what exactly we're escaping from, well, you see, the entire basis of escape velocity is centered around escaping the gravitational pull of an object. And gravitational pull is something that gets weaker and weaker the further you get from the center of mass of an object. But escape velocity is something that's different from constantly adding speed to counteract the gravitational pull and go into space, which would consist of constantly applying an acceleration greater than 9.81 meters per second to outpace gravity and eventually reach space. Oh no, that's not the case at all. Escape velocity is strictly about reaching a specific velocity and has nothing to do with maintaining a constant acceleration. More specifically, escape velocity is about reaching a high enough velocity where you don't need to apply additional acceleration or propulsion in order to escape the gravitational pull. Now, despite it being called escape velocity, it doesn't exactly mean you completely escape the effects of gravity. See, gravity is a dynamic force which means it's constantly there, but its value is also constantly changing. So going back to what I said about gravitational pull decreasing the further you get from the center of mass, remember when I said that the further you get from the center of mass, the weaker the gravitational pull gets, and escape velocity operates off of that very premise. If gravity was a constant value, then escape velocity wouldn't exist. The 9.81 meters per second we use isn't a constant, it's more so a standard value that takes the average gravity near the Earth to simplify calculations, since most experiments are done around sea level anyways where the gravity doesn't change as much compared to your higher altitudes, meaning that if you get far enough from Earth's core, then gravity becomes half of what it used to be, and escape velocity uses that ever-decreasing pole. With just a bit of logical thinking, you can easily figure out that if you have a high enough velocity, then you can afford to stop applying more thrust and still be able to go up without stopping. That's pretty much the entire premise of escape velocity. Think of escape velocity like a health bar. You start with a certain amount of health and you are being attacked by a goblin whose attacks get continuously weaker over time. Except the goblin's attack decreases faster than you lose HP. So by the time you're close to reaching 0 HP, the goblin is doing little to no damage. Which means that once you do reach escape velocity, your vertical velocity will slowly decrease over time. But the rate at which you're losing velocity is slower than the rate at which gravity is weakening. Therefore allowing you to cut off all propulsion once you reach escape velocity and still be able to drift onwards into space. Obviously, I'm not the best at explaining things since we're not like, what, the 3 minute mark? And we haven't made any semblance of progress so far. So I think now's a good time to introduce the equation for escape velocity to help you better envision the process. To calculate escape velocity, you use the formula VE equals the square root of 2 times G times M divided by R where g is the gravitational constant 6.674 times 10 to the power of negative v11, m is the mass of the object, and r is the radius of the object. And as a quick demonstration, let's calculate the escape velocity for Earth. A quick Google search tells me the mass of Earth is 5.972 times 10 to the power of 24 kilograms, or 597 septillion kilograms and the radius is 6.37 times 10 to the power of 6 meters, or 6,371,000 meters. Plug all that nonsense into the equation and you get 11,185.7264924 meters per second. Do some conversion and we get 11.1857264924 kilometers per second, or 40,268.6153726 kilometers per hour which is around Mach 32. To give you a point of reference, that's basically 10 times faster than the maximum speed of a Lockheed SR-71 Blackbird, the fastest plane in history so far. Also, just as a clarifier, any object on Earth would have to reach this velocity regardless of their mass, weight, or size. Whether you wanted to hurl a grain of sand or an infant into space, 
you would still need to launch them at at least 40,269 kilometers per hour. The difficulty lies in getting the objects to reach those speeds. It also means that one episode of The Flash was complete and utter bullshit. But I guess that's normal for a CW show. Maybe plummeting to your death is the motivation you need. So, to reach escape velocity, you're gonna have to go... that fast. Well, that fast is impossible, I can promise you that. Absolute bullcocky. I think it was more so projectile motion and momentum based than escape velocity. Could be wrong, though. I will if I jump. Barry, to make that jump, you'll need to go Mach 3.3, but only for a second. Ah, see? Mach 3.3. Told ya. Mach 3.3 probably has enough momentum for projectile motion. But they referenced escape velocity, so they're wrong. And yes, I am that petty. Actually, now that I think about it, speedsters are pretty much limited to going under escape velocity. Otherwise, it's space for them. Oh, and I forgot to mention earlier, but the equation for escape velocity, like most equations, doesn't actually account for air resistance. Because air resistance is such a pain in the arse to deal with. It's pretty much the bane of a physicist's existence. Nobody likes air resistance, it just makes things harder. Now, there's a saying, easier said than done, where things in practice are much more difficult than it sounds. Yeah. This doesn't apply at all, it's just as difficult as it sounds. In fact, spaceships don't even use escape velocity to launch because of the ridiculous speed you would need to reach to achieve it. Most materials would simply melt from the sheer frictional heat generated from trying to reach escape velocity. So instead, launching spaceships uses a much more straightforward and brute force method via launching with a slower but constant velocity, with continuous propulsion to maintain that velocity. Anyways, as you can probably guess by now, achieving escape velocity in more practical scenarios is unfeasible at the moment, since even without air resistance we already need a velocity of 40,000 km per hour. And so far the best space shuttle launches we've done have only managed to reach a velocity of around 12,000 km per hour at normal air density, and around 30,000 kph right before going into orbit. And the air density there is already significantly lower than at ground level. The only things that have managed to achieve escape velocity are probes, and probes are designed with the sole purpose of being as durable as possible to survive the pressure from being launched and the sheer amount of frictional heat generated thanks to air resistance. Meanwhile, manned spacecrafts are designed to be habitable for astronauts and protect them from the crap load of hazards involved in space travel. To give you an idea of just how different probes and manned spacecraft are, let's just shove this innocent astronaut inside a probe for a brief moment and then launch that sucker into space. Now, I don't know all the intricacies of how the human body responds to extreme conditions, but I know enough to tell you that you'll probably end up with a bloody, flaming mess and the astronaut explodes on the pressure and your splattered blood will probably just start boiling from the sheer amount of heat. It might have been better if we just shoved the astronaut into an incinerator instead. Also, did I just say that probes have managed to achieve escape velocity? Well, I lied. That was a perception check. And if you just accepted it as is, then you should probably stop watching shorts for a while. But if you passed a perception check, I don't know, you have my worthless validation I guess. It's like I said. The escape velocity equation doesn't account for air resistance, so probes achieving escape velocity is like a half-truth. The speeds probes have reached is only enough to achieve escape velocity in a free space or a vacuum, but they fail to achieve true escape velocity. I'll probably try doing some bullshit calculations to figure out the true escape velocity sometime in the future, I guess. Anyways, back to escape velocity. Everything with mass technically has an escape velocity. Just like your mom, for example, who has an escape velocity of approximately 2,796.43 meters per second. I'll let you do the math on that one. Now, to calculate the escape velocity for anything and everything, all we really have to do is keep g the same since it's a constant, and then replace the values of m and r. However, the radius can pose a problem. The radius is measuring the distance from the center of mass of an object. 
which I probably should have mentioned earlier, but center of mass is essentially just the average positioning of the concentrated mass, which as you can imagine is easy for symmetrical objects like spheres, cubes, and whatnot. Hence why escape velocity is only really used for planets, since they're spherical and have their mass concentrated around the core, which makes for an easy center of mass since it's literally at the core of the shape. So we can just take the radius and be done with it. But if we wanted to calculate the escape velocity of a human, it becomes annoyingly complicated. Since humans in most organisms have bizarre mass distributions and are rarely ever spherical, other than our human noggins or the morbidly obese. And unfortunately, most of our mass isn't concentrated in our heads, which means we have to take the mass of irregular shapes that constructs a human, and then calculate the mass distribution for each individual shape. Fuck. Oh, wait, this is my video. I can choose when not to do something. In that case, screw you. I just explained the process of calculating it instead. I think the best way to describe the process would be like how 3D and CGI artists render models, by breaking down complex shapes into more simple geometric shapes or polygons, so you can do a detailed mass distribution of the person, then calculate in the gravitational contribution for each component. The more detailed the geometric breakdown, the more accurate the mass is. Here, I found these equations via AI. We do all this and then just plug u into ve equals the square root of negative 2 times u or something, which is supposedly for calculating mass distribution. I'm not even going to bother explaining what any of the variables mean. I didn't even bother fact checking the equations, because I didn't feel like it. I'll probably just end up milking mass distribution for another video. Yeah, definitely gonna do that. But yeah, this is how you do mass distribution. You can try figuring it out yourself, or you can just wait for me to procrastinate and eventually muddle my way towards making a video on it. Alternatively, you could just do something called FME, which is the finite element method. It's like a computer-based method, which again, I really don't feel like explaining. I'd rather just go back to talking about escape velocity. So where was I? Right. I just finished talking about the equation and how g is obviously a constant so it stays the same. I could probably make a separate video on how g was found in the first place. But anyways, you should have a much clearer image of what escape velocity is now that I've crammed all this disorderly information into your brains. Since we have a specific velocity to work with now, it should make explaining things easier from here on out. Let's just round down Earth's escape velocity to 40,000 kph first to make things easier. Now let's also assume for this specific scenario that gravity is constant, which would mean escape velocity doesn't exist. But we'll just disregard that fact and pretend it does so we can calculate how long it would take for gravity to negate 40,000 kph. So if we first convert meters per second to kilometers per hour, then 9.81 meters per second translates over to 35.316 kilometers per hour which is about 0.08% of 40,000 kph, so almost a thousandth of a fraction, which would mean it would take over a thousand hours to completely neutralize 40,000 kph. And that's when we're assuming that gravity is constant, and not weakening over time. And gravity weakening over time would make it take exponentially longer. And... Hold on a second. The moon is like 390,000 kilometers away from Earth. And if we're taking a thousand hours to neutralize 40,000 kilometers... No shit. I've always assumed that Earth's gravitational pull stopped at the atmosphere being the dumbass that I am. But goddamn, just from guesstimating that's like over 40 million kilometers traveled over the course of a thousand hours. Which would mean that Earth's gravitational pull spans much, much farther than that. And... Holy fuck. If I'm estimating things correctly, then there's a good chance that Earth's gravitational pull reaches as far as Venus when Earth and Venus are near each other, and that's when we're accounting for the decreasing gravitational pull. But of course at that point it's most likely weakened to the point that it's an inconsequential amount of pull, and Venus's own gravity will easily negate it. Sheesh, I'm starting to understand how the sun can keep the planets in orbit now.
Ah,、uh, wait a second. Doesn't that also mean that we're ever so closely inching towards the sun? No, wait. Never mind. Turns out the centrifugal force from orbiting the sun is enough to bring us to a net neutral. So we don't have to worry about that doomsday scenario for now. At least until the sun grows bigger. Okay, wait. Never mind again. Not about the doomsday scenario, but before that, a quick Google search has told me that Earth's gravitational pull technically spans for an infinite range, because apparently gravity itself operates asymptotically, which means that everything has a gravitational field with infinite range. So I guess you could say that my influence is endless. If you just ignore the part where the further you get, the more infinitesimally close to zero it gets. You know, just as you're actually starting to like physics, they suddenly hit you with the goddamn limitless technique, and there's an annoying number of things in physics that operate asymptotically, isn't there? No、oh、god, I think I've actually managed to trap myself in an endless loop of scientific topics. The more I learn, the more things I don't understand and become curious about. I don't think I'll be running out of video ideas for quite some time now. Just gonna depend on my work ethic, I guess. Anyway, let's break down what operating asymptotically means. If we already visit middle school mass, then you'll probably remember something about asymptotes. You know these graph scenes where you get infinitely close to the zero but never actually reach it. Yeah, that stuff. In the case of escape velocity, then it means that with gravity spanning for an infinite range, then as gravity is decreasing your velocity, at the same time the strength of gravity itself is decreasing. With both values continuously decreasing over time, you eventually approach an infinitesimally small velocity because of how gravity is weakening faster than the rate you lose velocity, which essentially is the escape part. This probably just sounds like garbled and repetitive nonsense, so I'll just use the turn-based RPG analogy again. Forty thousand kilometers per hour becomes forty thousand HP, and the goblin has an attack value of thirty-five. So if you go first and you debuff the goblin's attack by zero point zero one percent, you lower the goblin's attack value to thirty-four point nine six five. And then the goblin attacks you, lowering your HP to thirty-nine thousand nine hundred sixty-five point zero three five. Nah, shit. I'm gonna need to have a constantly updating value for this, aren't I? Ugh. Give me one second. Okay, so now that we've made GPD write a code for us, I can demonstrate it more effectively. See, turn one matches up to what we said earlier, and then 4,999 turns later, your HP has been reduced to 5,270.00367967802. And then on the goblin's next turn, they'll be doing a measly 0.23500367967767 damage. You can understand why it gets simplified to escape velocity, right? With how slowly you're losing HP or velocity, you might as well have completely escaped it. I was not expecting you need to use some coding when I first started this, but let's move on to the conditions required for escape velocity to apply, or rather, the nuances behind certain scenarios where escape velocity works or doesn't work. First of all, escape velocity can't exist if gravity is constant everywhere you go, because a constant force means you would need a constant force to resist it. Secondly, as a quick recap, escape velocity operates off of the premise that the gravitational pull gets weaker and weaker as you get further and further from the center of mass. So basically, the same I just said. And thirdly, there are two types of velocity, practically speaking: horizontal and vertical velocity. On Earth, escape velocity is achievable using both types. However, strictly speaking, in a theoretical sense, vertical velocity is really the only thing that's necessary to achieve escape velocity. And like we just went over, escape velocity does not mean that you completely escape the effects of gravity. Gravity still applies. Your vertical velocity will still continuously decrease, with emphasis on the vertical part. It just decreases by an inconsequential amount. 
Which brings me to a scenario where escape velocity is impossible to achieve using only horizontal velocity, which would be if the Earth was perfectly flat. Just to reiterate, escape velocity only needs vertical velocity to become achievable. The reason why using only horizontal velocity works on a round Earth is due to the slight curvature of the Earth. Here, observe my shitty animation. See, as you gain speed, eventually gravity loses its influence on you since you're going fast enough to treat the slight curvature of Earth as a ramp. The slight curvature becomes a significant curvature due to your speed, which in turn allows you to treat it as a ramp. And the ramp converts some of your horizontal velocity into vertical velocity. So you're converting horizontal velocity to vertical velocity. If you don't convert any of the horizontal velocity, then you can never achieve escape velocity. For anyone that's driven a car in any context, just think of a small hill. If you go up the hill at a slow speed, your wheels stick to asphalt. But if you go fast and furious, your car will probably ramp off of the peak of the hill and gain some airtime before crashing back down from gravity. Reaching escape velocity in this context would mean gaining infinite air time where you're technically constantly falling back down towards Earth, but never hitting the ground since your velocity has reached a significant enough value to render the gravitational pull as inconsequential. Planes, for example, are constantly falling back towards Earth, but the winds generate enough lift to counteract it. But even then, the plane has to readjust itself every once in a while. Anyways, all this means that escape velocity is impossible to achieve using solely horizontal velocity, unless you have a method of conversion. A scenario demonstrating this would be having a perfectly flat surface that spans infinitely. No matter how fast you go horizontally, you won't achieve escape velocity. However, as long as you introduce a method to convert the horizontal velocity to vertical velocity, then you'll be able to achieve escape velocity as long as you convert enough velocity over to vertical velocity. The faster you go, the more significant the conversion is. But even then, there's no guarantee you'll achieve escape velocity since it's just a lot of nuances and specific conditions like achieving enough vertical velocity, loss of speed from impact, and loads of other pain and the ass conditions. The only scenario where escape velocity doesn't exist in technical terms would be black holes. Also, I guess not existing would be a rather inaccurate description. Since black holes have such a strong gravitational pull that not even light can escape its pull, and light moves at, well, the speed of light. And light is also how we see stuff. And if not even light can escape a black hole, then there's no chance we can see if there is something that can escape black holes. Unless equipment and stuff. Man, why doesn't college teach stuff like this? I'd rather learn about stuff like this, but nope. Instead, we learn about shit like calculating electrical fields without actually learning what they do and how they work. Oh, and as a side note, the kinetic energy must equal the gravitational potential energy at the surface of the Earth to reach escape velocity. It's not entirely necessary in the formation, but it does help give a deeper understanding of why and how escape velocity functions. I'm sure it means something to someone smarter. But I won't bother going into any more detail. I'd rather keep things strictly velocity based for now. Anyways, I don't think there's really anything else for me to cover about escape velocity. Except for the really, really complicated stuff that I didn't even know existed. So let's finish off the video by doing some useless bullshit calculations just for the heck of it. Uh, let's see. Since it's easier to use spears for calculating escape velocity, let's just go with the baseball then. And we'll use Major League Baseball rules for the baseball dimensions, which according to Google, baseballs have a radius of 1.45 inches, or about 0.03683 meters, and weighs around 5 ounces, which converts to 0.1417476 kilograms. Gravitational constant is 6.674 times 10 to the power of negative 11. So that comes down to... I'm equaling 0.1417476 kg and R equaling 0.03683 m. Plug all that in and we get an escape velocity of 0.0000022665.
4891827 meters per second. <sighs> or 0 0.000000022665489182727 kilometers per second. Or 0 0.000815957610577 kilometers per hour. I don't even know if I can give you an idea of how slow this is. Uh, let's see. Snails move at like 0 0.03 mph, so like roughly 0 0.05 kilometers per hour. Okay, yeah. A snail moves roughly 600 times faster than the speed. If you put a baseball in space and a snail on that baseball, the snail would probably easily reach escape velocity at the slightest of movements. I don't think the slime would help them stick to the baseball either. I think the only thing that could stay on the baseball would be microorganisms or something. Now, let's do one last set of calculations. Say you and your homie are on the moon. In order to toss them into the endless void of space, you would need to eat them at... Uh, Google tells me that the moon's radius is like 1740 km. So 1.74 million meters, and then 7.34767309 times 10 to the power of 22 kilograms, or roughly 7.3 septillion kilograms. Huh. Makes you wonder how Gru was even able to pocket the moon. Wait. Superman was recorded to effortlessly lift 200 quintillion tons with one hand, which would be 20 septillion kilograms. So, my headcanon is that Gru is as strong as Superman, if not stronger. Shut up, I don't care if the moon's mass decreased proportionally with its size, so Gru is as strong as Superman, and you can say nothing about it. If you have a problem with that, then you can write an angry comment and stick it up your ass. Oh right, I was calculating escape velocity. My bad. If we just plug everything in, we get 2374.1512749 meters per second. And then 2.374.1512749 kilometers per second. Which in turn becomes 8546.944589.68 kilometers per hour. Huh. The moon's escape velocity is almost five times smaller than Earth's. Which is still like more than two times faster than a blackbird. You know, as a kid I always thought the gravity on the moon was so weak that if you jumped too hard you would fly into space. Boy was I wrong and stupid. Well, turns out there's no conventional way to chuck your pal into space. But if you do find a way, then they'll probably drift through space until the minuscule amount of gravity eventually slows them down to an excruciatingly slow crawl where they'd be doomed to barely move for all of eternity. Unless they manage to crash into your planet before that happens. But wow. Who knew you could learn this much in a few days? Why am I even going to school? I'm just getting extorted at this point for a fancy piece of paper. I mean, just look at me. I'm not even someone hardworking. I'm a master at procrastination, and yet for me to be able to learn this much with some on and off research over the course of a week? Just think about what you could learn by yourself. <laughs>